All right, I know what you're thinking. What are those? Well, those are keen water shoes, my friends. Anyway, enough about my shoes. Good morning, greetings from the north coast of California, somewhere out of Mendocino County. I've decided to hop on this kayak and do some biology from the ocean. I'm originally from SoCal, so I love the ocean. The ocean has a special part, a special place in my heart. Always can't ever be too far from it. So I had some vacation time, decided to come out and do some biologizing. By biologizing, I mean uh, doing a little fishing. Fishing is a form of biologizing. I mean, any fisherman I know just loves bringing something up from the depths, get a closer look at it, and even more so, consume it. This is just one of the many forms of biologizing. Fishing is one of the more, uh, more enjoyable forms. Uh, especially being on a kayak out here because it's nice and relaxing. You know? And if you like life, if you like living things, you want to experience them up close, you know, get out and biologize. Learn something, change the perspective of the world that you live in little by little. Become much more smarter person, much more respectable person too. So if any of you are fishermen and you want to know what rig I'm using, I got some, I think this is called a high-low rig or a double high-low rig or something like that. I have a weight on the bottom. Uh, this uh, plastic lure imitation right here that works really well and a piece of squid up here at the top. Uh, this has been pretty effective anywhere I fish, anywhere I deep sea fish. And you just drop this down, I think we're in about 75 feet of water. Just drop this down, the fish are down there, they'll see it, they'll bite it, they'll eat it. And all you gotta do is just worry about bringing it up. Cast out. Drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. All right, while we got this bait soaking in the water, uh, Let's take some time to talk about the geography of this place. Now all this land that you see here on your left, that's all old marine sedimentary soils that have uh, over the past, I don't know, if, I mean more than five million years ago through tectonic activity that has all been pushed up uh, and exposed and uh, weathered away. So, and because of that uh, constant tectonic movement where you got one plate pushing up against the other, you have a really steep continental shelf. That means as you follow the land going into the ocean, the slope of that is pretty steep. That's why when wave pressure, when it reaches the continental shelf, it produces those big waves that all these surfer dudes like taking advantage of. And because of the shape of the continental slope here in California, uh, it provides a lot of rocky reef habitat, uh, a lot habitat for uh, a large order of fish, the order Scorpaniformes, highly speciose order to stack up along those rocks, multiple families, and one genus in particular that has many, many species, and that's the genus Sebastes. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna get at least one of those today. There we got a uh, bull kelp, Neriocystis, I think. Really common, uh, common kelp species up here in Northern California. Down in Southern California, you start, you start to see a shift away from, from this type of kelp, more towards Macrocystis pyrifera, uh, otherwise known as giant kelp. Each species can grow meters long and can actually grow meters per day. One of the fastest growing organisms. I think Macrocystis pyrifera is the fastest growing organism on the planet. I think it could grow up to like a meter a day or something like that. Oh, we got a good one here. Oh yeah. Oh, this is money right here. This is money right here. What is it? Come on, you. Oh my God! Look at this motherfucker. Are we eating tonight, boys? We's eating tonight. Damn, son. What? What? Look at that. Oh, that's so beautiful. All right, here we go. Perfect. Example of a scorpaniform fish, order scorpaniformes. This is Sebastes pinnager, pinnager, Sebastes pinnager, uh, otherwise known as the canary rockfish. Canary rockfish because it has this nice kind of like white line that straddles the lateral line system. The lateral line system is the sensory system in fish so they can sense water pressure, water currents, etc. Scorpaniform fish are known to have spines on the preopercal bone 
So this is the operculum. It's comprised of either three or four bones. You got the preoperculum, the operculum, the suboperculum, or interoperculum. Just some extra fish skull anatomy terms there. It's got some prominent spines on the head. Scorpaniforms also have these uh, big fleshy pectoral fins. Spines on the anal fin. Another unique fact about scorpaniform fish, at least in the genus Sebastes, this is in the genus Sebastes, uh, they have internal fertilization. So unlike many other fish where uh, the females will spit their eggs out or spew their eggs out and the, uh, the males will spew their sperm out and then fertilization occurs in the water column or on top of a rock or in a sand bed or something like that. These guys or these ladies uh, will take their sperm internally, fertilize those eggs. Those eggs will develop inside their bodies and when they're ready to lay the eggs, once the eggs hit seawater, they hatch into the little juvenile fry or not fry but you know juvenile larval form of, of fish but this is a this is a prime example right here i'm proud of this i'm gonna take this on home and eat the hell out of it mm -mm -mm. if you can see over there that i believe is a western gall laris occidentalis common seagulls that you see uh flying along the coast and inland uh, it's the type of seagull that likes shitting on middle school kids while they're at recess. Yeah, classic scavenging bird. That's a juvenile right there. I think it takes a couple years for juveniles to to get that form right there. Yeah, just opportunistic bird species. They'll eat the fish coming off of fishing boats. They'll eat a sandwich right out of your hand if you let them. If you leave your food sitting on the beach, they'll steal it. They even know to approach you when your back is turned. Oh, look, we got brown pelicans. That's always nice. Pelicaniform. Okay, there we go. Now we on. Feel it pushing, feel it pulling. This is probably another rockfish. Smaller one this time. Oh, there we go. All right, another member in the genus Sebastes. All right, this is Sebastes mystinus, otherwise known as the blue rockfish. Let me uh, reposition real quick. There we go, better light. Sebastes mystinus, otherwise known as the blue rockfish. Again, in the order Scorpaniformes. Scorpaniformes has these spines right here on the pre opercle bone. Yet another common scorpaniform species that we got here along the coast of Northern California. And they've evolved a, a mid water column lifestyle, hanging around the edges of kelp, hanging around the outsides of, uh, of rock reef structures, etc. And uh, they don't really stay hunkered down to the rock. They're more of a kind of swim around, see what tasty morsels are around and then just pick those off. They're not really like ambush predators per se or anything like that. They're also a good tasting fish too, which is why I'm finna take them home and eat it. All right, I noticed in the water we have uh, these little things floating around. I think these are salps, which I believe is in the phylum Eurocordata, related to sea squirts. And uh, they're actually a distant relative to all the vertebrates. So uh, in many ways, in more ways than one, you as a human being are related to these more so than you're related to, let's say, uh, a grasshopper or something like that. Even though this is an invertebrate, it shares uh, some common synapomorphies with vertebrate organisms. And these are just basically planktonic. They free float, filtering out things in the water column. And then subsequently fish and other organisms would eat these too. Salps, Eurocordata whole nother phylum learn some oh yeah we are on oh oh we got some nice pool here we got a nice fight right here oh yeah another sebastes i'm assuming oh my god look at this oh Something going wrong with my GoPro, but bam, that's what I brought up from the depth right there. My GoPro died, but here we have the cabazon called cabazon after cabeza because that big ass head right there. 
very cryptic species perfect for uh, camouflaging within the the sargassum and the in the seaweed that might be at the bottom growing on the rocks ambush predator it decided to ambush my lure and this is the biggest one that i've caught look another scorpaniform fish not in the genus sebastes uh, I forget the scientific name of this right now, but it's, it's because I'm excited because this is the biggest one I've ever caught. But again, it's another scorpaniform fish. And you can see these nice, giant, fleshy pectoral fins uh, that are indicative of scorpaniform fish. And again, right here, the pre opercle bone. You got spines, two prominent spines. This is going to make a nice meal. Hell yeah. I guess that's my time out here on the water. It was a very productive day. Uh, I'm really satisfied, really happy. Caught my personal best canary rockfish and my personal best cabazon, plus a few blue rockfish. All representatives of the order Scorpaniformes, very common order, seen off the coast of California, very well adapted to California's uh, nice steep slope continental slopes underneath the ocean water and man yo this shit is fun we got we got a lot of birds too again i need the right camera to film these birds we saw some brown pelicans there's some pelagic cormorants oh here we got a pelagic cormorant flying right here nice pelagic cormorant got a lot of invertebrates in the water some jellies comb jellies salps pretty cool spot to biologize this is a pretty dope spot. If y'all got a kayak, I suggest you come out here, check it out. Make sure you're all legal though. Make sure you got your fishing license and you follow all them regulations. You don't want to get caught up by DFW. Get a ticket that's over a thousand dollars. Don't nobody want that. So with that, that's all I got for today. Peace up, peace out, learn something. Okay, the biologizing doesn't stop. It also continues on uh, with the processing process. Uh, what I mean to say is that uh, there's also biology going on in the inside of living things, uh, if you don't know that already. So we're going to do a little bit of a dissection slash uh, fillet preparation for myself. I'm going to fillet this fish up because I'm planning to eat it. And uh, at the same time, we're gonna look at a little bit of internal fish anatomy. And maybe you might learn something about the physiology of these fish too. But first, let's look at the, uh, at the outside of the fish. Right here, classic, classic fish shape. Nice uh, fusiform shape. Fusiform just means like kind of like sort of more or less torpedo shape so it can move smoothly in the water. You have your anterior dorsal fin rays right here, which are usually composed of uh, nice stout spines. And in many species within the uh, scorpaniform order, a lot of these spines are coated in a, in a mucus venom. So if you get stuck with them, uh, it hurts pretty bad. Not just the spines on the dorsal fin, also the spines on the operculum and also on the pelvic fins. So yeah, again, classic fish shape. You got these dorsal fin, you have your anal fin, your caudal fin or tail fin, your pectoral fins, like the arm fins, and then the pelvic fins, which are like the hip fins or leg fins, so to speak. These dorsal fins and anal fins help it keep it straight in the water column as it's swimming around. These pectoral fins will also help with steering, and these pelvic fins will also help in steering as well. Let's take a look at the face. Classic fish face right there. You got these nice large eyes because this is a predatory fish. This fish will be patrolling the kelp beds and the rock reefs in Northern California looking for tasty morsels to swim by like squid, isopods, jellies, other fish, stuff like that. It's got this large mouth. If I can get it open, I guess it's not that large. But you can see the, uh, the protrusion that it makes when you open the mouth. That's because of the articulation between certain bones. This is the premaxilla, then you got the maxilla. And in many fish, these bones have evolved uh, different structures for different adaptations based on feeding. Let's look inside the mouth. All right, oh, it's got some of its 
breakfast left over in there. It looks like a bunch of, let me see. Yeah, it looks like a bunch of uh, those salps, those uricordates that we saw floating in the water. All right, this right here that looks like the tongue, it, 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 it's kind of like a tongue. I mean, it, it can taste things. It has chemoreceptors on it. But at the same time, uh, it's not the tongue. It's, it's not the same kind of tongue that you and I have. Our tongues help in swallowing and, and other things. These tongues help in uh, procuring the prey in many fish species, not this one, but in many fish species, these tongues, or it's actually called the, the basohyal, because there's a bone in there, the basohyal bone, and this is covered in flesh with either chemoreceptors or, in many cases, teeth. A lot of other fish, especially fish in the persiform order, have uh, bones on the teeth. Trout and salmon have bones on the teeth, too. You also have bones on the upper ridge of the mouth, the, the vomer plate. I don't know if you can see that, but the, the, there's a vomer plate in here. Uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of skull bones that also have teeth like structures on them and that's when they when they grab whatever prey they have like a fish or a squid they'll close it and then that tongue will press against the roof of the mouth to crush it even more some species of fish have even more uh highly adapted crushing mechanisms inside their mouth and uh they can crush things like clams and crab shells and stuff like that another thing to look at are the uh the nostrils or uh Sort of like the nasal openings. They don't have noses like, like mammals or, or any type of tetrapod or anything like that. These, uh, <clears throat> these nostril-like structures here are purely for chemo reception, for scent. And they always have an internal or ingoing current nostril and an X current nostril. So water can go in and out unidirectionally so it doesn't confuse any chemicals that it might be sensing in the water. Okay, let's get inside it. Okay, all right. Hopefully I didn't pierce too many organs. Okay, all right. The internal anatomy of a rockfish. By the way, I think I called this fish uh, Sebasti's pinninger uh, out while I was catching it, but uh, I was wrong. My bad, my bad for the BS. This is not Sebasti's pinninger. This is uh, Sebasti's carinus, otherwise known as the copper rockfish, not the canary rockfish. There are many species of rockfish, uh, and even with me, it's hard for me to tell the difference on a lot of them. But I just uh, confirm the ID. This is a copper rockfish, Sebastes carinus. All right, anyway. All right, let's start with the muscles. Or oh, you see the skeleton here. You notice that it has this, uh, this kind of up curve and then goes straight back. And you see where the muscles are attached to the vertebral column and it has these uh, radiating bones that come out here so the muscles can attach to them and allow for that fish type movement. The muscles, I don't know if you can see this real good, but you can see that they're separated. These muscles are actually called myomeres and those myomeres, they're, they're, interlocked, they're interlocked together like that and when it gets nerve impulses from the brain to tell it to move, They'll contract in that way that allows the body that side to side movement so it can propel itself through the water. All right, looking at the guts, right here, this buttery piece, that's the liver. This right here is part of the intestine. It looks like this one is a male. These are the, the gonads, the sexual reproduction parts. Looks like it's a male because it's nice, white, kind of homogenous, uh, homogenous looking. Uh, which means this is probably a sperm producer. If it was a female, you'd see little globules in here, which, uh, which look like eggs, essentially. Right here is the stomach. Feels like there's a lot of things in there. Let's go ahead and cut it open, see what it's been eating. Ooh, juicy. Oh, yep, it's been eating those uricordates, those salps that was floating in the water. Wow, fish been gorging on that. Ooh, it stinks, ugh. All right, I think right here, you have the pancreas, which supplies insulin, and uh, I can't see it, but in here somewhere, you have the pharynx, which is the throat, goes to the stomach, but just behind this should be the heart, and it's in there somewhere. Up along the ventral surface of the spinal column, uh, a lot of fishermen like to call this the bloodline, uh, there is a lot of blood in it, but it's uh, it's essentially the kidneys. 
So the kidneys, if you know anything about physiology, kidneys filter blood. So that's the reason why there's a lot of blood in there. So that's what it uses to filter out the metabolites or uh, any of the, the salts that might occur inside this fish's body. If you were to follow this bloodline all the way to the anal opening, uh, you'd be able to see that there's this little tube that goes to the anal opening. That tube is essentially like the urethra in this fish. And you can't see it right now, but you can probably see the cavity of where it once was because I accidentally punctured it as I was filleting this fish. There is the gas bladder or the swim bladder and it's lined with blood vessels. I don't know if you can see that right there. Let me turn this fish around. If you see that right here, it's got these blood vessels. This is called the reet marabla, which uh, I think translates to miraculous reet. Anyway, those are filled with blood vessels that allow for oxygen diffusion or, or gas diffusion into this sac right here so they can maintain their buoyance in the water column. All right, I guess that's it. That's, that's the basic uh, fish anatomy. I'm gonna finish filleting this and uh, get these nice pieces of meat ready for me to eat. Again, I hope y'all learned something. Biologizing has many faces, wears many hats. Uh, this is another one of them. And this is why I like biologizing, especially while fishing, because you can catch fish, take it home, eat it, and in the process of processing it, you can learn a lot about it. All right, for real this time, that's all I got. Hope y'all learned something from this. If you didn't, I apologize. Make all your decisions scientific. Stay away from all those gimmicks. I'll make a boss slice. Peace up, peace out. Learn something.